Hey everybody, Jonathan Fields here, and I'm really excited for our guest today. I have with me Barbara Corcoran. Barbara, welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. You're a handsome guy, John. Ah, uh, stop. Thank you. Um, so let me, for those, you know, for the one person on the planet who doesn't know who Barbara is, let me give you a quick thumbnail here. Barbara is a real estate mogul, having, having built a business, a multi-billion dollar business in the New York area, starting with $1,000 that, that she sold for, we'll get into it, that she sold for a nice chunk of change. Um, they became a best-selling author, and, and a lot of you guys will also probably um, recognize her outside of the New York area, especially because she is the only woman shark to currently swim with the sharks on ABC's Shark Tank show, which I happen to be a huge fan of. And Barbara has a new book out called Shark Tales, How I Turned a Thousand Dollars into a Billion Dollar Business. And I love the description that you guys sent along with the book, and I read the book, and it's, it's just so spot on. So I'm going to share this one sentence with you guys. It's, it's a story of growing up one of nine siblings suffering from dyslexia, making D's in high school and college, not finishing college. Better than F's. 20, right, much better. That, that, that D counts, actually. It Working does. 20 jobs before the age of 23, borrowing $1,000, and then turning that into a $5 billion business. Um, that's a heck of a lot of accomplishment in one person's lifetime. So a lot of lucky breaks I might add on that one. Yeah, and, and I want to get into some of that with you. But before we get into the actual content of the book and also then sort of sweep forward to what you're doing now, one of the things that struck me about, about the book is that it's – um, there's a tremendous amount of business value in the book, but the book, it's not written as a business book and as in, you know, here's lesson one, here's lesson two. It's stories. The entire book is stories. And I happen to be obsessed with, with storytelling and the structure of story and story as a marketing and sales medium. Oh, I don't I'm, think of it that way. I think of it as just good to listen to. I, I think so too. But I mean, is that something where, is that also the way that you conduct business? Do you communicate largely in stories? Is that something that you found sort of just a valuable way to engage people on a business Yeah, I, I don't think it was by plan by any means. But what I found is if I told a story with a moral, it's the reason the Bible works. It's the reason some of these great books work through eternity. Is I found that I would meet people five, ten years later, and they never knew what I had said in a lecture with be my own salespeople, a total strangers, business people, whoever. They never remembered my nine main points, but they always said, "When you told me this story about that puppy sale and how blah blah blah," they remembered the story. So I knew very early on that stories had stick to itiveness, and it's in simple language. It doesn't sound uppity. It doesn't sound fancy, but people have a way of remembering them. Yeah, and and and. Uh, it's been so true, just with my experience across a wide variety of things in life and in business. Um, it's it you can talk and rant, rant and rant and share principles and ideas and concepts. It's boring, and, right? <laughs> there's no there's nothing to hang your hat on. I guess that was the whole sort of concept that the book made to stick. Mm -hmm. Also, storytelling is this fundamental thing that for some reason our brain latches onto and we actually remember it and it's, it's incredibly compelling in business I think. It's also a great association with if you're lucky enough to have a parent who read to you mm. is a great association with being told a story I think from when you're a kid. I think you're probably right it's kind of funny because I, I have a nine-year-old daughter now and um, I still you know when, when we put her to bed every night I'll, I'll create a completely new story just from thin air and a lot of times we'll spend 15 or 20 minutes. And you'll make up the stories? We can make completely made up and sometimes we'll you make them up this, together. The same old stories. <laughs> no, it's, and it's amazing because it's she's starting to develop this ability to craft really fun off the wall stories and, and um, it, besides it just being fun and a great way to connect with people, you know, I think it will serve her well in life also. Well, guess what? You're grooming your poor child to become a real estate sale <laughs> something with a lot of baloney, so shame on you. Well, as long as she's just something that she, she absolutely enjoys and has fun in life, that's all I really care about. So that's what you should care about. Yeah. So I, I want to get into some of the, um, the experiences that you share in the book also and just some of the, my fascination with your, with your journey. And, and as we mentioned, you started off literally borrowing $1,000 and then turning it into this incredible company over a period of, of uh, was it a, a, probably a couple of decades or a decade it's and a half? 25 years, actually, almost to the day. Yes. Right, so 25 years. And within that window of time, this wasn't a, a smooth line. You know, you just start in slow growth and, and everything is a nice smooth line oh, going gosh. up. Life is never a smooth line. You know that. Right, absolutely. And there are some really huge setbacks. And one of my fascinations in business is that we, we all have these moments in time. I call them the crux moves. It's sort of a climbing term. I'm sorry, what did you pull it up? I call them crux moves. It's actually a term out of rock climbing where, you, you know, you get to this point and you have, you have to face this question. There's a massive amount of, of uncertainty going ahead. 
Um, and you're not sure, you know, you, you're asking the internal question, do I hold or do I fold? Do I, is it insane for me to press on and dig, think that I can keep building? Is, or is this the time where it's really intelligent, the universe is telling me to step back? Um, you, you seem to move into these moments and always push through them. What is it that signaled to you on an internal level that forward was the direction to go? I don't think, uh, honestly, you want an honest answer. Not yeah. To hear, right? The honest answer is I don't think I ever had a signal to move forward. I was too ashamed to admit defeat. Hmm. And for me, that old cut of being such a lousy student and all that public failure of, of reading out loud in front of the peers and the shame that went with it in the classroom, I don't think by the time I was 21 I could tolerate one more shameful experience. So what drove me was simply my determination not to have anybody laugh at me ever again. And so it wasn't that I thought I had a shot at winning in the bad times or thought of a great angle. It was that I was just tired of being a loser and I just was not going to let anybody see me in that position ever again. Mm -hmm. And that is a wonderful thing to push me forward. Also, by the way, that boyfriend who loaned me the $1,000 and gave me the ultimate insult when he ran away and married my secretary by telling me I'd never succeed without him gave me a double insurance policy. Just the thought of he and his new pretty wife <laughs> laughing at my failure would also drive me. So I was running from shame, not running towards success. And I'm sure that's not the right way to do things, but whatever floats your boat, that happened to work for me. But that's interesting, right? So, uh, so because a cur big curiosity of mine is always, you know, there are always the, some sort of blend of two sides to motivation. There's the pain that you're trying to push away and there's the desire that you're trying to move towards. And it sounds like, at least in the earlier part of your career, maybe even the later part of your career, it was really what you were trying to push away, the pain you were trying to make sure either didn't return or um, you, you didn't want to experience in some way. That what was are you, a shrink with a guitar hanging out? <laughs> wait, wait. What? That's how I write my songs. Uh, the song goes into and the music. He, then I'm going to be playing the guitar. <laughs> and I think I'm, I'm ready for anything. <laughs> no, you got that exactly right. I think once you get some success under your belt, you can run for how far can I go. So halfway through the career, that became more the motivator. Like, whoa, when am I going to get nailed? How far can I take this thing? Yeah. Could I really take it to the moon? And then this sheer excitement of winning a race, that coupled with the tremendous satisfaction I got to see that I had a shot at winning mm -hmm. and to actually blow by the big boys in the marketplace who were controlling the marketplace that maybe I could even beat them in the race to the top, that became a great additional motivator, but not for those early years. The early years was just running away from failure and nothing more than that. Yeah, and, and it's funny, you just used the term big boys and boy being a key word there, especially in the New York real estate market. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, this is something obviously I can never experience because I'm not a woman, but it, it had to have been... You were pretty tough. Oh, stop, come on. I'll throw a wig on for our next time, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, this had to have been a really fascinating time to sort of step in and say, you know what, um, to hell with all of you. Yeah, I, I am equally good. In fact, I can probably kick all of your asses. So bring it on. I mean, what, what was the, the response? I'm curious, not just from the men who you were sort of going up against, but from the women around you when you when you said I, I'm going to own this yeah well I don't think I ever self-declared to myself or to them in a public way I'm going to own this because I don't think it would be good business strategy to make people feel shaky about their territory right. now you're always better in sneaking in from the back end on anything <laughs> that you want to control right so I had a vastly different response from the men who own the large firms in town the old boy network I was never welcome, but hey, you know what? It was fine with me, honestly, because I was the outcast in the school. So I was used to being an outsider. That was like right up my alley, feeling like somebody who wasn't, you know, really at the head of the club in any way. Right. So that I came in from the back fence, and I don't think those guys ever took me seriously because I wore a red suit. I had a short skirt, and I talked entirely too much, and I didn't go to the right schools and all the rest of the baloney that goes with that kind of thing in a sophisticated town like New York City. But so far as from the women, you know, there are no women-owned firms, but 90% of everybody who worked in real estate in New York were female. So from the women, I think I got initial little suspicion, but from my female salespeople to see a female starting to win, it was a tremendous motivation to all the women in the field, in my own firm and outside my own firm. So they were always on my side. And then, of course, you add my other group of guys, my gay guys. They love my butt. I mean, they couldn't <laughs> wait to see me win. So I had two-thirds of the population out there on my side, and that ain't so bad, right? Right. Now, hey, 
it's a good percentage to be behind you. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and you also battle, and we, we talked about this, because you, you had the firm for some 25 years or so, and the real estate market had some major, major swings within that window. Um, around the 90-91 was one of the big challenging times, I know. And it was, you share in the book, a, a really challenging time for you. And one of the things that I love also about what you wrote is how you just you constantly drew back on stories and lessons from your mom and mm-hmm. took those and reinterpreted them into these incredible ways to actually rejuvenate your business and sometimes look like come back from the abyss. You shared this one story in the book about the puppies and how you we oh, scored a million dollars a day. Would you mind just taking another minute or two and sharing it with us? No, not at all. You know, it was one of those terrible times in real estate where I was hot to the moon. I owed Citibank three hundred and some odd thousand dollars. I owed my lovely ad agency over a hundred thousand dollars. It was terrible because of the pain of feeling like I wasn't doing well for the people that I was committed to. So I was sitting at my desk writing my goodbye speech for my last January sales meeting, announcing that we, like everybody else in town, were going out of business. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly remembered that my mother had taken us as kids, and I hadn't even thought about it. You know how these childhood memories are there, you don't know it? I remembered her taking to the old chicken farmer across the way from my grandpa Ward's house in southern New Jersey and sitting us down on the road and watching all these fancy New Yorkers line up to buy Jack Russell puppies. And the reason they were lined up and the reason they were arguing and there was so much tension in the whole thing was because the farmer had the farmer's wife, Louise was her name, she had invited everyone at the same time, the same appointment, 12 noon, to come and buy a puppy, and there weren't enough puppies to go around. Mm -hmm. So, of course, these New Yorkers hated each other because (laughs) only half the people in line got a puppy to take home. But here's what I learned from that lesson. It popped in my head, and I instantly thought, I have the solution to selling 88 properties owned by a big insurance company in town that can't be sold. I simply took them all, averaged out the price, priced them all exactly alike, and whispered about the secret sale to my salespeople at the next sales meeting instead of announcing we were going out of business. The sale happened one week later. We had 88 puppies, so to speak, to sell, all high floors, low floors, little apartments, big apartments, certainly not equal apartments. And whoever came into the line first got the pick of the litter, and that's how I phrased it. And you know we had over 150 people hours before the sale, standing in line in the worst real estate market the city has ever seen on the heels of the stock market crashing. And why? Because everyone knew and appreciated the inequality. And when I handed out that secret list, people ate it as though it was candy. They ran to the apartments and ran back and bought the apartments, signed those contracts on the spot. And I made in commissions, net commissions, in I would say less than two hours, I made over a million dollars in the worst real estate market, paid on closing within two weeks. It was mind-boggling. And, and that was nothing but copying something that somebody else did, nothing original about Right, that. and this was for, for, if I remember correctly, these were apartments that hadn't moved in like three years or something? Like the, they, they were the dregs of the market. Right. I mean, they had talked to every broker in town and asked, we can't do a public auction because they didn't want the shame, the public shame. We can't reduce the prices. How could you sell them? I mean, is right. that an impossible proposition? But you, we even sold the dogs. And why? Because even the person who got the lousiest apartment in the bunch looked behind them and saw another 50 people really angry that they right. got the thing. Well, I guess it's sort of like the auction mentality. Oh, that, what? Yeah, it's sort of like the auction mentality, too. It's like you go in intending to spend one price and all you just get swept up in the energy of it all. And you know what I really learned that day, even though I had learned it in many ways prior to that in, in sales, I really learned the most valuable lesson is that Everybody wants what everybody wants, and nobody wants what nobody wants. Those were the same damn apartments, the same ones that nobody wanted, and now they were the hottest thing in town. It's all in positioning, isn't it? Yeah, and it really is incredible. You know, the exact same commodity or asset, it, and it's just about how you spin it. And, and um, I think it's a huge lesson for anyone looking to start a business, too. And, and I, I have conversations with a lot of entrepreneurs. I know you do these days also. Yes. Brand spanking new, and a lot of the things that they ask me, and I'm sure you get asked far more than I, is you know there are a million other people doing what I'm doing. You know, like who am I to do this? How am I different? Yes. And it's this is a great example of you know what these were like you said these were not even just on par apartments. These were the dogs, these and the- you figured out a way to completely change the positioning and sort of the psychology Envy. around them. That's a full thing, Envy. <laughs> yeah, that's a powerful business tool, right? But you know what, truthfully, that was a one-day sale and a one-day exception, I might say. Right. I think far more important to anyone building a business is to 
figure out one gimmick you could use again and again in your draw of blades, so to speak. And the gimmick that I used building my company from the first year till the 25th year when I sold it for an outrageous amount of money was creating a market report that is open to anybody in any business, giving statistics on your own business to reporters as many as you can. I got so much press coverage, I honestly stole the market share by stealing the limelight because I was constantly in the press being quoted on statistics. Mm -hmm. And that, frankly, is the big kahuna of building businesses that so few companies take advantage of. Right. Which, which is fascinating to me, too, because I operate in, in, in a large part in this sort of bizarre, morph, constantly morphing world of social media these days. And one of the ethics that it grew out of is giving away 90% of, of your knowledge for free, knowing it's, that people will circle back to you and then pay a huge amount of money for the 10% if you use that free knowledge to establish a huge amount of thought, leadership, credibility in the market. And it, it really works. I've used it a number of different ways. I know a lot of other people. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it, so, and, and what you're talking about is really doing something very similar. It's, it's doing a lot of work, creating a really intelligent data set, turning it into easily digestible knowledge, and then sharing it with everybody. And that positions you as the go-to, the person who knows everything in the market. Well, you know what you get from that? You get loyalty, you get trust, because right. people, they're always giving it out. And more than anything, they come back for more. And anybody in business, no matter what you do, and you want them coming back for more, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to move on because I kind of like to sort of explore three paths in the conversation. And one of the other things I'd like to sort of move into is um, is the, the other the, sort of the, the challenge of building a business when you're also you're not a kid where you don't have obligations. You're, you've got a family, and you're married, you've got kids, and, and maybe you start without it, but eventually you grow into that. Yes. But you're really, so you have these dueling quests. You want to be really present in your family, and especially you coming from a, a very large, very close-knit family. Um, but at the same time, you've got this incredible Jones to build something really cool. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you explore those, those often dueling energies. Mm -hmm. well, honestly, Jonathan, I didn't have that as a, as a challenge for me in my career because I didn't have children until I was 46. Mm -hmm. So although I was married by 30, all it was was my husband and I. Right. And I must say, if now that I have two children, my first at 46 and my second at whatever, 55, <laughs> so I'm an old mom, but a happy mom. Mm -hmm. But I must say to you that I never had the competition from raising a family, which is certainly true of just about every mom building business, so it's a great majority of the moms. And if I had had children, quite, if the truth was told, I could have never built that giant business because you have two people you're serving a God to. And, and even in the five years I had a child and continue to build my brand and my business, it was terrible in those five years. Mm -hmm. I was now only giving 85% to my family and 85%, which is my, a lot more than most people could give at once. But, but the truth is I could no longer give 150% to my business. I felt terrible, and I felt terrible not being a 150% parent either. Right. And so I really had to give away one of my children like Sophie's Choice and I gave away that damn business so yeah. that I could focus on parenting then for that, that point in my life. Yeah, and I think that's but one I of the... I have to ask somebody else on that. When I was living like a single man with no responsibility, hyper-focused <laughs> on building my business, I kind of had the life of a guy more than a girl in that regard. <laughs> but it's fascinating too because when, then when the kids do enter the picture, it's, it really changes the dynamic in a pretty profound way. Absolutely. Well, what happens is you're the caregiver now, just not in, in any business. I mean, any entrepreneur is building, they are the parent. They're the parent feeding the kid, right. and the kid is the business. So all of a sudden, you're you're like strung, strung between two families. It's a it's untenable position and very difficult to have all your guns blazing all the time. Right. Which and is interesting. No, which is interesting too, because um, you know one of the things that you shared is that. Uh, you, you did. You reached a time where it was time to sell the business, and you sold it for a, a, a nice chunk of change. I think in the book you said sixty-six million dollars or something 66, like that. Sixty-six. Yes. Not My, bad. <laughs> that's how I set the sale price. They still don't know how I set it. I do the calculations on formulas. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, so you move away from this, and you're somebody where, from the outside in, the world is viewing you as this incredibly talented, gifted, driven success story. But within a fairly short period of time after selling this, this you know, your baby that you birthed and built for 25 years, mm -hmm. you're, you're pulling back and saying to yourself, was this just a fluke? Do I really have no talent? Um, talk to me a little bit about this sort of really radical shift and this, time, this window in time for you. Well, do you know, um, I think it has a lot to do with how you're built from being a kid on up. You know, I had no success as a child. I had tremendous 
success once I got out outside the jailhouse, as I call it, called school. For me, it was like being in jail my whole life, okay? So I was so happy to be free and to be able to be somebody else once I got out there. Nice. So having that kind of freedom, um, and you know what I just realized, Jonathan? I think I lost sight of your question. Where was I going with what the heck I was talking about? Um, <laughs> uh, the, the question was, now I just lost sight of the question as well. Um, no, it was after you left the business and, um, you know, you were, from the the outside, you, know, you were perceived as really successful, but now you're in this place where you're really doubting yourself again. Yeah. Can I tell you why? Because I really had lost the definition of myself. 90% of where I spent my time was as Barbara Corcoran, the well-known real estate broker. And once I had to give away that jacket, in essence, literally, my red clothes I got rid of. I was always in a red suit. That was my power power signature suit at the time. I actually sent 14 red suits to my arch rival at the time once I blew by. <laughs> I never wore them from what I had to say. But boy, did I have fun packaging them up, <laughs> name on it. But without knowing what I was going to be and without, it, two things, without knowing where I was going, I had always had a very clear goal, crystal clear. I wanted to be the queen of New York real estate, short and simple, easy for anyone to see and define. And once I got there, it was done. I sold the business. But without a clear definition of who I wanted to be now when I grew up, I was lost because I didn't have a goal. All right, I'm very goal driven. Without having my team of children around me, the ones I hired, fired, uh, matured, trained, loved, adored, hated, all that richness of life and building a business, without having that team anymore, I felt scared and lonely. Who was I going to parent? One child? God bless my son, Tommy. He would be on a shrink couch if I didn't decide to do something else. Imagine putting all my energy on one kid, the poor kid. God bless him. But going forward, I had to really go to the roots of myself and really wonder why I had been successful. And I concluded within two short years, the only reason I had been successful is I had been lucky. And it was just a fluke that I happened to build this giant empire. Of course it wasn't true. But that's what happens with stinking thinking when you don't know where to direct your energy and your thoughts. And I unhappily wandered around in that no man's land for a good three years before I decided, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a somebody on TV. I'm going to become good on TV. I can talk to people. I love an audience. I, I sat down one day finally and wrote down everything I had liked best about Corcoran Group and everything I liked best about the 22 jobs I had before Corcoran Group and then made a list of everything I hated. And guess what it pointed to? The same old things in TV world that got me where I was in the publicity world. And so I decided to become a TV personality in real estate first and then hoping to work my way into the entrepreneur corner. Eventually, if I could muscle my way there because it's where I'm most at home. Right. So, so and from there, you started um, sort of with... with sort of spots where you're focusing on, on real estate and then grew it into... No, 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 the first file, listen to this irony, was Fox TV. They hired oh, right, right. a political consultant, me who had never read a newspaper in my <laughs> life. Do you have any idea how dangerous that is? I used to memorize names and I didn't even know who the president was. So here I am being a political expert for a year, but at least they gave me a gig and that was the starting point. Right. And, and that gave you the exposure to eventually, um, I guess it was a couple years into that, where you turned around and you got this opportunity to to explore moving into this next phase, which is the show um, Shark Tank. Oh, thank God for Shark Tank. When I got that call from Robert Burnett Studios, I felt like I had stepped in a pile of good luck for sure. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I was hired and signed the contract, I only got the call two days later that I was on hire, that they had hired some young, blonde, big-chested, beautiful girl in my place. How upsetting was that? And that's when I wrote, thank God, immediately sat down and wrote the email to Mark Burnett telling him what a bad mistake he had just made. And you know what? Thank God for all the pressures of life and all the insults and the rejections that come with building a business. I was tailor-made for taking another rejection. After all, I'm a real estate salesman. And I had to walk away so quickly an email to him, not vicious, but selling him on what a mistake he made and please have both babes come out and compete for the lone shark spot. And we did and I won and thank God. But if not for writing that email, my God, I wouldn't have the shark tank and what a blast that show is. I'm having every minute of it before and after and during the show. It's just a lot of fun. Yeah. And I'm, 
that difference, which we all want to do, of course. Right, and and that's a, and, and I love the fact that actually you actually include the letter that you sent to Mark Burnett in in the book because it's it's a fat honestly it's a fascinating read. Um, it's a turning point, you know, and it's a great lesson in not taking no. And exactly. People eventually take no on too many things. But if you never take no, you're going to get a lot of them turn to yeses, of course. Right. So let's so let's kind of zoom forward now and talk about Shark Tank. And one of my curiosities for you is, what what is the show giving you? What is the experience of being on the show and and investing and becoming involved in these companies? What is it giving you that you didn't weren't getting in your prior life in the, in the building of your own empire? Um, not really. It's giving me the same things, honestly, that I had in building my empire because I was able to build a business by building the people. Mm -hmm. The reason I rose to the top is because people lifted me up and stuck me on their heads and shoulders and cheered me on. And the people who did that were the people I helped. So my whole goal in building the Corcoran Group was, one, making sure we stole the limelight in the media, which we mentioned before, but where I spent 90% of my day was building my own staff and doing everything I could, like a mother who wanted to spoil her kids top to bottom, to see them succeed. Doing everything I could to see those individuals succeed. And what am I doing on Shark Tank? I'm putting, again, just like I did in my sales staff, putting tremendous money into these entrepreneurs and then standing on my head to make sure they succeed. It's the same old routine. And you want to know it's really ironic. When I sold the corporate group, one thing I got tremendous relief from was my psychiatrist gig there, which is tending to high, like, like high strung nut job salespeople <laughs> make millions of dollars a year coming in for my help day in and day out. I felt like a shrink, much like you you are, I could see with the damn guitar. <laughs> but Every day I was doing that was such a relief to get a break from that. I was exhausted from it. But what am I doing now? I'm the shrink for all these entrepreneurs, just like I was for my top salespeople. Because every good entrepreneur is a phenomenal salesperson. They're wired the same way. Right. And so I'm back in the same business, but without it just all being real estate, a variety of businesses all over the board. Yeah, and, and you just brought up this term also, wired the same way. One of my curiosities around entrepreneurship or people that start anything, people that create anything, you know, something from nothing, and especially in... Uh, on a quest to do something really big, is there's a huge amount of uncertainty in doing that. There has to be. If there isn't uncertainty, that means it's already been done and who cares? And a lot of times that causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear that paralyzes people. I'm, I'm curious, has that been something that you've struggled with? And with the people that you're, you've worked with, both in Corcoran and in as entrepreneurs now, it, it, how do you work with that, and, and how do you sort of work well, with that? I think with that's that? the juice of business. The, the high of business is actually realizing you have something that nobody else did yet. And it doesn't have to be a whole new product, but you have an angle or a product or an approach that's totally different than everybody else. That's the juice that makes you drive on if you're any good at your trade. Right, so I don't see that as a liability. It's scary in the best sense of the word to go, right. oh my God, oh my God, how did I think of this? Oh my God, will it work? I mean, all that kind of anxiety is positive anxiety. It gets you hopping, moving faster, working longer hours because you got to get to the end of the story and see if the damn thing works. That's good. The anxiety that's the poison of building a business, the poison of any success, whether it be at home or in business, whatever you do, is the self-doubt, the stuff that makes you say to yourself, do I have the right to be here? Can I invite myself in? They don't like me. Uh, why would I want to be there if they don't like me? Let me tell you, the first night I was in L.A., saw that Hollywood sign, I was like 12 years old all over again, a little kid. I couldn't believe it. You know, I had my own bodyguard, my own stretch limo. I was like, holy crap, this is, I, I just can't believe this is happening to me. But the minute I saw that blonde bombshell across the dining room table with all the other sharks, and I knew they didn't have any competitors there, I was the only one, she and me, competing for the lone girl shark. Let me tell you, my heart sunk. That's the stuff that kills you. If you realize you're kind of defeated or believe your odds on winning are so slim that you start to self-defeat yourself. That's a poison that is scary and should be scary because that's the stuff that puts you away. The right. other stuff, a point of difference, a gimmick, anything you could do better, a different or wacky or whatever. I mean, heck, you know what I found about trying anything different? You try anything you even can think of, and nobody remembers your failures out there. They only remember your successes. I had more failures, certainly, than successes. But, you know, nobody gives a damn. Nobody's watching the failures, only you. They seem so important to you, the flops. But what they remember are the successes. That's all they count. But I've never met an entrepreneur, including the young entrepreneurs I'm working with. The ones that are good and are going to succeed are the ones that are always trying and doing things wrong, quite, quite frankly, because they're not afraid to keep trying. 
right. They're almost like too stupid to know any better. Uh-huh. And that's great because it's a great marking for anybody who's going to succeed. Right. So, so here's my question around that. Are, is, is, is that mentality in your mind something that's wired at birth or is that something you can develop over time or through experience? Well, it's a great, it's a great lead if you have it from birth. Now, I had a mom who told me was, I was amazing, even though the whole system out there was telling me I was stupid. So I just chose to believe my mother when I got out of there because I didn't have to hear their voices every day and see the report card. But So thank God I had a mother who thought I was a genius and constantly told me I had a wonderful imagination. Don't worry about it. You'll fill in the blanks. I mean, she was just like pump, 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 positive, positive. So I had like two options, right? And the mom went out, thank God. But the thing is, is if you don't have that, the real heroes in life are the people I've met who didn't have the upbringing, had either one decent parent, one loser, or no parents at all. And somehow, at some point along the way, decided that it was no longer an excuse for not making of themselves what they wanted. Those are the people that can develop it on their own. And frankly, those in the end are the people that are the most formidable competitors. Because all of that strength was homebred from their soul up. And there's nothing you could do to compete with those people because they're driving through you if you don't get out of the way. Okay. And I have met so many people in business like that. They're sometimes not the happiest people. But if you want to know what's good for business, that's something that really can drive a person. The unhappiness they're running away from or the, the lack of love they had or whatever. Maybe not so healthy. But they get even through business, and there's some formidable people out there like that. Yeah, and, and I guess the other side of the question then is, like you said, that that can very often drive somebody to the absolute top of whatever field they commit themselves to. But then when they get there, the question is, um, what what what's it been for? They get everything they've been questing for. You know, like they've had the highest, the loftiest goals on the planet. They build exactly what they build, and then they get there, and then they're sitting there saying, "Okay, now what? I don't feel like I thought I was going to feel." And not that that always happens, but you know, I, I wonder sometimes about... Well, let me tell you, I think it happens often enough, but not often enough, because a lot of people can't really get um, in touch with themselves to realize they're empty about it. Mm-hmm. I think the trick here in any success is to really realize the joy is in the getting there, without a doubt. When I went to my Citibank machine and put in my little card to get my $200 allowance each week, three days after I sold the business... I still get a thrill when I hear that chit 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 at the city bike machine when your money's coming out. It's like printing money. You know why? Because I got that receipt that day and it said 60, so I think it was the first two thirds paying $48 million I had in my checking account. I couldn't believe my eyes. Like, I have $48 million in my checking account. Of course, where did I think it was going to go? Out to Mars and back? But there it was on my little receipt. You know, I have it framed now, of course, in my office. But here's the thing. People have to appreciate that all the joy is in getting there. When you get that bundle of money, and believe me, I've been poor most of my life, and then got rich at the tail end of my life. Well, not so tail end, but toward the end, the, the second inning. But the reason uh, it's it's you've got to get the joy while you're getting there is there's no charm in having a bundle of money. Let me tell you, you get the charm of knowing you don't have to worry about your bills for the rest of your life, but it brings so many complications with it. People see you differently. People are hitting on you. Everybody's got a $10,000 problem. You're equal siblings that you're always equal to. Suddenly, you're the rich one in the family. Everything gets complicated. Money is a complicator. So don't, I'm just thinking that it's not a great God to serve. The great God to serve, honestly, is to try to see how far you could go and how many people are having a good time going there with you. And that's really where all the juice comes from, not the rest, not certainly not the bank account. I haven't found. I haven't found. Maybe I'm not buying the right stuff yet. I haven't bought it. <laughs> and it's going to make me feel really good or a new boat or something. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know it's interesting too because I haven't I, I, I haven't achieved what you achieved in business yet. Um, <laughs> you look like the kind of guy that's going to achieve because people love you. I, I don't know, love that, it. I don't I, even know I, you. I, I, What's I wrong with that face? Nothing. Look at you. <laughs> the teeth. Your mouth are adorable. People are going to love you. Don't have to worry about that. Um, but but what what I have done is is um, you know I've, I've the businesses that I built have been small and I sold and I've loved being in them. I've I've built I've loved the I mean people ask me all the time what's the best thing about entrepreneurship is it the control is it the money I say that's nice, but honestly for me it was always the ability to create my own culture and grow, pick the people that I surround myself with, mentor them, grow with them, and um, and play with them and and watch that you know sort of family rise together. To me, that's the most extraordinary thing about being an entrepreneur. Well, Jonathan, you know, another way of putting what you just described, those four pieces in a row, is you create your own world. Now, if somebody said to a kid, what would you rather do? 
you want to grow up and, and join somebody's world? Or would you rather create your own world? What do you think an honest child always knows is the right answer? Yet we buy in as we get older into buying into somebody else's thing. And you know what? Nothing, and I agree with you 500%, is more satisfying than the ability to create your own world. And if you do it right and other people buy into it and you can honestly make it their world too and they're as much in love with it as you are, look at how much happiness you get and satisfaction. What a blast. Thank God you're doing it. You know? Thank and, God. And, and it's fun. And one of the, one of the things that I, probably the, other, the second thing that I love about doing it also is, is the knowledge that my daughter sees me um, going to work every day, and I, I work at home, I work at cafes, I do you know, all sorts of different things. Um, she sees that I, that I treasure um, something beyond money, you know, I make a nice living, but she sees that there's something much bigger out there. And you, know, this is, and you know this, as a parent, every parent knows this, that you can say everything you want to your kid, your kid's going to watch what you do. Yeah. And sort of like setting that message for our kids, I often think about the notion of legacy and, and what it really is or isn't. And to me, you know, the, the, the biggest way to actually leave that legacy is, is not in what you teach or not in the hunk of money that you leave behind, but in the way that you live your life and allow your kids and your family to see it uh, and to be involved in it. And you know what that amounts to from what you're describing, your lesson for your daughter? She's seeing a happy dad. And let me tell you, happiness is contagious. Nothing's better than giving a kid the gift of happiness, happiness around them, because they get in the dirty habit of expecting it for the rest of their life. And so I don't care how you get there, but if you could convey that, Every day, you got a good kid coming down the pipe. No doubt, yeah, it's taking you so long. One kid, what's wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> so, but and let's kind of wrap up on this because you brought up the idea of happiness, and also um, one of the things I love is is that you treasure in what you build sort of a culture of joy, a culture of fun, it, like like almost nobody that I've ever seen. And you know, this, the stuff that you would do for your company and the, the dashes that you would throw. Um, it, it seems like that's that was so pivotal to, to the way that you, you you do everything in business, but it's so lacking in so many other businesses. What gives? <laughs> well, you know what? I think, uh, I think most businesses run from the left brain, and the left brain always tells you that if something doesn't pay off in a quantifiable sense, it's probably poor spending. Also, most large businesses are run by committees, so people weigh in. And you know, in anything, there's a hundred reasons why not to do something and right. do it. So I think that in my business, the reason, half the reason it was successful other than the media is because we had a culture of fun. I spent more time planning fun and more money by basically pissing it away on fun that anyone else would think was misjudgment. And you know what? I couldn't quantify how that made me money, but all I knew is when my people were laughing and loving each other and happy all the time, they came and made more sales every time. And so I couldn't like pin that deal to that party or right. that bizarre uh, transvestite cross-dress party that everybody laughed like crazy, but everybody cross-dressed. I couldn't say they made that big deal because of it, but let me tell you, I knew instinctively that half the deals we made was a result of the fun that I was so careful to plan for my people. And you know what else? Once you get to be a big company, here's what happens. You have tons of people making a ton of money. They're winners, and all your competitors are after them. And you know what? They could go to a competitor and get just as much advertising, just as much support, and maybe even a boss as nice as me. But you know what? They weren't going to be having as much fun. Where would you work? Right. The company that has these benefits or the company that has the same benefits and also has a fun, fun time. So the fun was my secret weapon. And you know what? By the time I was in business 15 years, everybody was on to it. Every competitor out there was starting to plan fun. They didn't know the first thing about it. But Christmas party. Um, Amateurs. Tell us, whoa, aren't we having fun? That's pathetic. Who even wants to go? I had my parties in February, the worst year of the the worst month, tax month of the year. I got all my venues half price, and I always had a theme. And if you weren't dressed in that theme, you weren't coming in. So even the stick in the mud type personalities who had never been into anything fun their whole life came and had fun. And you want to know, they adored me because I gave them fun. More than that, I gave them money to make. Come on. So it's, you're right. You start off by saying it's underutilized or whatever word you use to say that. People don't use it in business. What a waste. What a waste of a power tool to create a fun environment. It makes money, no doubt in my mind. Yeah, and, and it's also how much more enjoyable is it to build a company based around that culture? We gave a party two nights ago for my book party, all right? Uh, 
it's funny, like, what do you do for a book party that's different? What did we do? It was called Shark Tale, so I dressed as a beautiful merm. I'll send you photos if you like to be. <laughs> just all my men at the party had dropped in gorgeous bodies. I ordered them. They were all in bikinis. They had glitter on their bodies. We had a giant real-life mermaid in a bathtub with bubbles. <laughs> that's great. You know what? So what did that cost me twice as much as a regular party? Because I had to hire all these people. I had to think of the costumes. We had to think of how to make the damn bubble machine work so people didn't slide on their butt when they went into the bathroom. We had to think of all these things and spend all the time. But guess what everybody's talking about? They're talking about the book. Because they went to the best damn party they'd ever gone to for a book party. And so right. it's all in the gimmicks and the energy and the drive and all the work that everybody on my team put into it. That's what made the difference. And if you think that's not going to sell books, of course it's going to sell books. Because people are going to tell other people about the great party they went to. A little right. example, of course. But it's so true about anything in business. Yeah, and, and it's funny. You use the word gimmick. And I think a lot of people have a negative association with the word. But the truth is... is you use it in the sense of this was this is built into the culture. It's built into the way that I do business. It's not just shtick that you throw up against the wall. This is part of the core belief. This is part of the way that I actually make everything happen. Well, you know what? I don't think I realize it's a it's a culture thing. I don't think I ever thought of it that way. And when you do your first gimmick, it's really just a gimmick, like right. teaching dogs how to shake hands and pass co-op boards, or uh, talking about Hillary. Clinton, what apartment she should buy, and waving to her voters in the booth. That's all nonsense, and it got publicity. But when you do it repeatedly and start thinking in those terms and see the results of that kind of energy put into it, what happens in the parties and the dress, the, 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 all the ridiculousness of the whole shoot match, suddenly it all adds up to a culture. And you know when I think I discovered the first culture within the Corcoran group was when I stuck my Chanel-clad 14 women that worked for me when the company was small on an open air bus and took them on a bus tour through Harlem as they clung to their pearls and purposely had the guy pretend the bus broke down and leave them on 145th Street when Harlem was the scariest place in the world. <laughs> now it's not. It's a great place. And you know what? They told that story to every young salesperson that came into the company for the next 15 years. That's a culture. I didn't see it for that. I thought it was a fun night out and a spoof. But it became a culture, and when I saw that replicating of the tales and the storytelling that happened within the company, that's when I knew I was on to something that other people just weren't quite on to yet. Yeah, and, and, and I love that. I love just your, your whole approach to, uh, to business. And, and um, it, it seems like so much of what you do is, is not based so much on numbers, but just based on instinct and intuition and just what feels right to you. And, and I wonder, what, now in this sort of newer role that you're, where you're actually on, on the show, you know, and you're looking at all these people present to you and everybody's out there and they're, they're desperate for some money and they're desperate for your assistance and your knowledge. Um, what is it that you really respond to with these people? Is it the numbers? Is it the personal energy? Is it the story? Is it, is it a combination or is there, is it a gut reaction? You know, what, what? It's a, it's a gut reaction for sure because you're not sitting there and thinking, uh, here's my checklist. Let's check off the numbers. Let's check off your whatever. It's a gut reaction, but when I think about what each of the entrepreneurs that I got fired up about and put my money in and my time, much more valuable than the money in, um, what is it that I was responding well to? I was responding well to someone with enormous energy. I've never seen a person succeed in anything without enormous energy directed toward it. I never have, all right? So I don't think I consciously think of that, but if that person doesn't have overflow of energy, I'm not responding well. If they can sell their product well, if they can convince me that this is the best thing since sliced bread, who are they going to convince? I mean, I'm there to be convinced. I'm prejudiced toward listening. I'm paid to be there. So if they can't sell me on that, I'm not buying in because how the heck are they going to sell anybody else? They're the salesman. I've never seen a business succeed. You're the salesman of your shop. You might not call it sales, but you are. So if they don't have it, if they can't convince me, they're out, or I should say, I'm out, because they don't have what it's going to take. And you know what else I'm looking for? I'm looking for someone I can trust. I know it sounds like a ridiculous thing, like, why do you have to trust? I'll tell you why you have to trust. So the last thing I want to do is be in bed with somebody that I have to second guess. I don't want to have to check where, where the money is going, etc. I mean, you do that as a matter of call, sort of after the fact. But you want to have someone you can trust who's going to be appreciative of the fact that you jumped in there to be with them. Because that spells happiness, and that puts the emphasis on the joy is in the getting there again, which is what I got out of the corporate group and what I'm going to get out of each of these businesses or I'm not going to be there. It doesn't make any common sense to me.
Yeah, and, and that makes so much sense too, um, especially when I've been looking at a lot of the, I've been doing a lot of research on, on how entrepreneurs, especially startups, change their model. And, yeah. and very often, even after somebody has you know VC funding, they completely pivot their model two or three times. So what they're doing is nothing has nothing to do with what they got funded to do. But the the VCs and the angels invested in in the people. There was yes. something that resonated, and they they said these people. I don't know if this is the idea, but by God, these people are going to kick ass at something, and I want to be a part of it. Yes, and you know what? I think a lot of angel investors really do commit not only to the people, but they are they buy in on the idea, and also those same investors often will get a lot of resistance from the angel investors when they want to totally revamp their model. Mm. But you know what? The entrepreneur always comes through, the good entrepreneur. Right. And so there are more success stories, I think large success stories, with revamp models than there are in original models. And I've noted even on my little businesses that I'm shepherding now, uh, two of them totally reinvented their product, totally. And you know, that's fine with me because you know what? I definitely knew from the get-go with each of these people that I was buying in on them. It wasn't, it was, I mean, if the business had to make sense, of course, but the real buy-in was the entrepreneur, no doubt in my mind about that. And that's what gets you to stay with them through the hard times. Right. So. And, and, and there will be hard times. I, I've never met an entrepreneur, and certainly in the ventures that I've had, there's never been a... You know, we're, like we said earlier, that where it's just an easy, straight path. There are these big moments where everything sucks for a chunk of time, and you got to figure out how to push through them. And it's that energy and that belief and the drive that I think really are just critical there. Um, one, one last question to wrap this up, and that is, um, you, you have, as we mentioned when we started out, you're, you're the only woman on uh, on this TV show, surrounded by a bunch of other men. And you have also invested, you've put your money up um, when all the other guys on the show have passed. And I'm curious, do you feel like there's something um, that comes from a woman's perspective that allows you to either see something or intuit something or feel that you, you want to buy into something that's different from the way a man would look at it at an opportunity? Absolutely, and it's a huge advantage I have because I have the female perspective. And as you know, half the buyers out there are women versus men, so I've got that in covered, right? And I could use their perspective on the male piece well enough, all right? But I'll give you two perfect examples. When um, Tiffany Crummins, which was from season one, walked in with her little elephant medicine dispenser clay model. I don't know if you saw that episode. It was one of your latest episodes. When I bought that into that business, controlling interest for $50,000, Every shark, once we went off air, laughed their asses off at me. <laughs> but the next morning, they were honest enough to say their wives, who were watching the taping, two of the trophy wives there, bam, their husband that night. <laughs> they said, why didn't you buy it? Why, what was missing? Why didn't they get it? Because none of those guys were up in the middle of the night trying to jam medicine down a sick kid's throat, and they don't want to take it. They're gagging on it. The elephant works. Those... Kids taking those Tiffany's, and now she's in all the CVS stores. She's right. selling like hotcakes. It's because I could, I've could. i been up in the middle of the night too many times, and I know what that's like. That's an advantage. I'll give you an example from last week, if you saw it. There was a product on there about uh, uh, toys that get shipped out once a month because your child gets... Um, not your child gets tired of toys, so why not ship them in every month and replace them? They're sterilized, and it's only eighty dollars a month or something like that. I listened to that, and I thought, what a terrible idea! The men thought it was a great idea. Every shark competed and drove that price up. Why did I think it was a terrible idea? And I don't know if it's a terrible idea. That was my female response. I thought, uh uh, I'm the one that's always buying my five year old toys. And half the joy is letting her buy the $2 toy, the $4 toy on a Saturday, the next Sunday, the looking forward, the promising, the bribing. Yeah, you can have a toy if you get it. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And right. all of that's gone if you're going to get a neat little shipment once a month for your kid. So I realized that was missing the excitement and the control of controlling child rearing through toy buying. Mm. I need that in my family. <laughs> so I was out the minute I heard the concept. Those guys went like crazy bidding on that product. So there you have it. Men and women look at things differently. But you know what? Who knows who, knows who is right? Who's right are the businesses that two, three years from now are going to fly to the moon and back and succeed. Right. And I hope we all win because we're all picking out great products, you know. Right. But I hope I win more than those guys. <laughs> I really do. I want a better report card. <laughs> well, it's going to be awesome to sort of follow along, actually, and see how all the different companies do over time. But um, anyway, we, we match. We Friday night. You better promote the time here. Friday night. What time is it on? Nine o'clock. 
Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock, right. ABC. Right. You bet. Friday night, ABC. One hour later on Central Time. One hour later, Central Time, Shark Tanks, and... Um, hey, check that. I'm always mixed up on numbers. What time is it, Chelsea? Eight, seven, Central. Oh. oh. Eight, what, what is it? Tell me again, <laughs> quick. Eight. Come in here. Tell him. You tell him. Here she is. She's good at numbers. Thank God. Hi. It's 8, 7 Central on Friday night. Fabulous. 8, 7 Central, Friday night, Star Tank. And, um, Letters. And the, the, I'll, I'll put it underneath uh, the, the show. Well, and, um, it's just going up substantially every month, but we've only got eight weeks here. we got to slam it home. I'm relying on you. Think of a Shark Tank song. Play that guitar. Come on, give us a lift here. I'm going to have to get, create a little bit of a jingle now, the Shark Tank jingle. Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and Barbara, thank you so much. It's been a real joy just hanging out with you and, and hearing your stories and diving a little bit deeper. Um, again, everybody, the book is Shark Tales. You can see the big, giant, cool picture behind Barbara. I will, um, of course, give you a link and pictures be, uh, below this on the, the show page. Um, again, thank you so much, and I look forward to the next episode of Shark Tank this Friday, 8 Eastern, 7 Central on ABC. <laughs> Got great energy. Thank you, John. Thank you.